Thank you, Alessandro, very much for that new invitation to be able to hear to present you some data on TB. Um, so as you all know, um, TB is a very global burden. And um, alone in, in 2017, there's about 1.7 million people died of TB. And there's more than 10.4 million people are fell ill with TB. So it's certainly a global uh, TB epidemics that we currently have. And this is really reflected by the world map that you can actually see here. That's the incidence rate, in particular, our institute and the ICGB Cape Town component that's uh, based in Cape Town, the tip of Africa, has a very high incidence rate. Uh, uh, Kalicha, for example, has more than 900, uh, which is a suburb very close to Cape Town, 900 uh, incidents per 100,000 uh, people. So it's uh, particularly affecting uh, Africa. And um, tuberculosis, it's a uh, transmittable diseases that uh, <coughs> you, you can see here. The infection agent is mycobacterium tuberculosis, and that can be transmitted with, with droplets. There's only two or three infection doses, very small. Um, only three to five bacteria can then induce diseases in the un humans, and as well latency. Um, so the current treatment for TB involves um, antibiotic treatments. Uh, there's a very limited number of new drugs that are approved for treatment of TB. Um, so there's certainly a need to develop new TB drugs. So in the first part of this study, I will <coughs> show you some developments in our lab, how to um, um, produce new uh, drugs for TB. And one particular compounds that we have is, are, is the minor groove binders. And you can see here, these are binders that actually uh, intercalate into the D DNA in, in that uh, part into the minor groove. And you can see here, and the particularly they have a very high affinity for bacterial and parasitic DNA. So you can see these compounds actually bind to the minor groove and then <coughs> uh, prevent uh, bacterial replication. So um, in, together with our collaborator at the University of Strathclyde in the UK, and they have produced many different modifications of this basal structure. You can see here that's a distamycin. That's a structure that composes of a head. That's a base. And then you have a tail. And they produced uh, Colin Sucklin and Fraser Scott, many different modifications of these, of these compounds. Um, this is shown here. I don't want to go into detail of the chemical synthesis of these compounds, but that's the basic distamycin basic template structure. And they made alteration to the head to the base, <coughs> and as well to the body. Um, so we're producing many different compounds, and they also looked at their uh, activity and against um, gram-positive bacteria on this paper. Some of these compounds have been shown to be selective against malaria, and as well against uh, Trypanosoma brucei. Um, so um, there is also one compound that has been licensed for treatment against uh, Clostridium difficile. And this one has been recently completed as a phase one clinical trial. Um, so uh, our uh, purpose of this involvement in that study was really to identify um, the antibacterial activity of selected compounds. So here we screened 86 compounds um, for their activity to kill mycobacterium tuberculosis. So at the initial stage, there was an in culture a system where we had mycobacterium tuberculosis. Here we're using this particular strain that was linked with a GFP, so green fluorescent protein. And we incubated several um, uh, doses of these minor groove binders. And then the output was actually in days in culture, different time points from 2 to 14 days. We actually, uh, as a readout, was the fluorescence. And that positively correlates to the growth of MTB. So um, in particular, we want to identify at what minimal inhibitory concentration 99% of all TB is killed. So what dose of the MGB you have killing of more than 99%. So in the first study, we, we were identified uh, to hi hit um, compounds, these particular two ones with quite um, good uh, micromolar activity uh, against MTB. So we published this data um, this year. And in that conclusion, we really saw that the thiosol unit, the head groups of these MGBs, was particularly important to give this anti-activity against TB. 
Um, but we actually didn't stop here because we, we wanted to take advantage of these heat compounds and look at the structure activity relationship um, between um, those that provided to be highly active and therefore many more compounds were then synthesized by our collaborators. So here we had about 96 compounds. We're not going to the details of the synthesis and we actually screened that these compounds for the bactericidal activity against TB. This, I'm going to go a little bit faster here because it's the same uh, readout that we're having, GFP expressing TB with different concentration of MGBs. I believe them in culture. And this is just a typical example from one of that compounds that we tested. You can see here, if you have TB in culture, in the culture medium it grows over time um, at 10 and 12 days. And then when we're adding the MGBs, this is the chemical structure of the MGBs, this 362 you can see we're actually achieving inhibitory activity of 0 0.39, which is um, very low. So it's a 10 times lower what we identified in our previous study. So this is again TB in the presence of, of low concentration of, of these MGBs is not able to grow. Um, so these are a snapshot of all these MGBs that we screened is 96 and we identify now six, we call them six heat leads, uh, particularly this is 362 and um, uh, 368 with particular low MRCs. This is rifampicin as a positive control, you can see. Um, but in order for um, active compounds to act as well, um, they also have to be active inside the cell. So this is really to identify this intracellular killing at activity inside cells. And, uh, and what is important as well, are these cells really toxic for this mammalian cells? Therefore, we also perform toxicity or cell viability assays. So this is an uh, illustration of what we're using in our system. <laughs> we have macrophages. These are primary macrophages, <coughs> bone marrow-derived macrophages for mouse. Um, then we're infecting here with TB. So particularly important, that's a clinical strain, a hypervirulent strain, the HN878. Um, and then we also we first infect, take the cells, we infect with TB, four hours post-infection, we use these MGBs at different concentration, and at five days after infection, we look as a readout the growth of MTB, but we also want to ask, are these macrophages still viable, because uh, are these MGBs toxic or not, and these are the two different <coughs> readouts we have. Um, so this is the gr MTB growth curve, you the intracellular growth of, um, of TB inside macrophages, and you can see here what we're showing here is a different dose response. So on the x-axis is um, uh, concentration from 12.5 of the MGB362 to all down to 1.56. So we, we identified here this MGB362 three, with uh, MIC50 of 4.09. So what that means at what concentration, you can see here at 4.09, you have 50% of intracellular killing of TB. And particular as well on the toxicity, so we don't see any toxicity of these compounds, even if you go with a higher dose to 12.5 micromolar. Um, this is for the one compounds, and I just show you in comparison to rifampicin, the control, uh, which reaches MRC value of 1.7, and this one is 4.19. Important, uh, these uh, other hit compounds, which we call three, 364, is also not toxic at that concentration MRC of 50, 4.19. Uh, and we, if you actually take in one of these graphs, again, we actually see the very low concentration of, of the minor groove binders, 1.56, we actually do not observe any killing activity. So this is no drugs, this is 1.56 micromolar drugs, and this is the growth in macrophages, you can see here it's quite similar. So therefore, we actually wanted to increase now this increased drug delivery system at the site of infection. And for that purpose, we want to use a non-ionic surfactant vesicles, uh, which is um, produced by the University of Glasgow by our collaborator, Catherine Carter. And you can see here particular uh, schematic representation of these non-ionic surfactant vesicles. So these are small vesicles, and you can see here these are the surfactant bilayers. And so it contains as of these surfactant bilayers, but as well of an of a aqueous compartment. 
and importance, we can actually deliver only hydrophobic trucks, but as well hydrophilic trucks. Um, as, um, and one of our means would be then to include MGBs, which are hydrophobics, uh, into these vesicles for better delivery into macrophages. So what we produce now is these MGBs that we're encapsulating into the NIFs as a vesicle delivery. And we also want to look at the intracellular clinical activity. Uh, are, are these uh, uh, encapsulated uh, MGBs into NIFs better able to kill TB inside macrophages? So for that uh, purpose, again, the same layout where we have macrophages, infect them with our clinical strain, the mycobacterium tuberculosis, and then we're using a comparison MGB only or a MGB conjugated with these vesicles. So um, then the readout is five days post-infection. We're looking at the growth. And see if you, and again, those particular hit compounds that we have here, um, as a readout, you can see the growth. So that's, again, a C view, how many colony forming units, so how many bacteria are found in the macrophages from a control. And this MGB, a very low concentration, as I showed you before this data, there's no difference. In, uh, in the growth, but as soon as we encapsulated these MGBs in the NIFs, you can see there's a, a re significant reduction, uh, almost a twofold reduction in, th in the growth of TB inside macrophages. Um, this uh, other compound, 362, we have a trend of a reduced growth, but it's not significant. Um, but this is uh, identified now for subsequent studies, in particular this uh, compound, 364. Um, so um, what is important as well are, are NIFs in combination with MGB toxic against mammalian cells or not. So therefore, we looked at the cell viability. We don't see any difference in uh, toxicity. So that's the control. That's the MGBs. And these are the MGB NIFs. What's important, actually, there's no reduced cell viability. So in other words, these, these compounds are actually non-toxic against mammalian. And what we actually shown here as a conclusion is this minor groove um, binders contains activity against mycobacterium tuberculosis in culture. They uh, also kill intracellular uh, clinical strain of MTB in macrophages, and as well, they're non-toxic against mammalian cells. And in, uh, the lastly, we also showed this encapsulating of MGBs into NIFs uh, provided an increased intracellular drug activity against MTB. Um, so we published these, uh, these data uh, this year, in 2007, in the Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. And we want to take this really further uh, because we identified these hit compounds. We want to go into lead characterization and using then uh, animal models in, in vivo and using the Cornell or, or a, a reactivation model um, with current NTTB drugs. So this is the first part of my, my talk. We're really trying to develop new drugs against TB. And the second one, we actually want to increase the host resistance. So we want to find factor in the host that TB targets and uh, that TB is able to develop resistance and persistence. And particularly, we will want to look at macrophages. And um, we actually want to look at a host-directed therapy for TB. So I maybe should introduce a little bit clearer for you because um, the current treatment for antibiotics that's currently used has a, a severe complication. There are very different strains of TB, uh, of drug-resistant TB strains that develop. So uh, they're multi-drug resistant, extremely drug resistant, or even totally drug resistant strains. So there's certainly a need for an alternative treatment approach. And we want to actually particularly focus on the macrophages and identify which genes TB really wants to regulate. Um, and therefore, we want to perform a differential gene comparison in macrophages, classically activated or alternatively activated as an M2. Um, to better illustrate these examples, I made a little cartoon and showing that it's the macrophage here. <coughs> you can see here, this is the macrophages. And macrophages can by cytokine then activate it with interferon, for example, through the receptor, and then inducing a, a very important a uh, bactericidal mechanism, so nitric oxide, that's a factor killing molecule. So this, you can see here, that's a substrate. This is the synthase, the enzyme, 
producing nitric oxide. And if you have N available, it can induce the killing of intracellular bacteria. So alternative well macrophages can then be activated uh, with, uh, with M, in the M2 activation stage. So these would be AL4, AL13 cytokines that binds to the AL4 receptor alpha. And importantly, actually, both pathway, the classical and alternative activation, they use the same uh, L-arginine as a substrate. So you could imagine if you actually you lift TB inside macrophages, you would actually to, to harbor or probably potentially induce rather this, this arginase pathway and therefore limiting the production of nitric oxide, <coughs> which then subsequently induces uh, killing of TB. So using uh, this experimental hypothesis, um, we actually uh, then in collaboration with our collaborators at the as a Phantom Consortium in Japan, we activated these uh, macrophages from bone marrow of macrophages, either classically or alternatively. And you can see here what we've performed here. Um, in red, you can see the classical activation with interferon, and as well with AL4 and AL4-13 combinations. So these are alternatively activated, and these are different stimulation time points. So you have macrophages either classical, alternative activated, and then we infected these macrophages with mycobacterium tuberculosis, this clinical strain, and uh, important is really the time kinetics at different time points. We then um, extracted the RNA, and um, with our collaborator in, uh, in Riken, in Japan, we performed the cage transcriptomics to really identify which factors are now upregulated or downregulated in an M1 environment that normally harbors the MTB killing or uh, in an M2 environment potentially gives you a replication niche for arginase. Um, so what we publish here subsequently, you can just see that's the PCA, so the differential cluster between interferon and the AL4 and AL13. Uh, yes, that just means these macrophages are, are clustered differentially, the host responses. In particular, we actually also focus on transcription factor. So you can see here, these are the transcription factor that are upregulated in M1 versus M2. And uh, here in particular, we actually focused on the BTF2 and the rationale for that. If you stimulate these macrophages with interferon, these are the time points. You can see here that BTF2 in black, it's uh, prominently induced in these macrophages and even more than IRF1. So we wanted to investigate the role of BTF2 in, in MTB infection and therefore also use the SH uh, lentivirus approach, SH RNA approach to block then uh, BTF2. So you can see here, these are macrophages that we, that we actually use with uh, heat killed TB. You have a response of NOS2, but when we block uh, BTF2 with SH RNA and NOS2 is down, you can also see TNF and as well, AL12 <coughs> is so significantly downregulated by blocking BTF2. <coughs> um, so this we published indicating, that, um, it's probably better to summarize in that review that we wrote that BTF2 together with IRF1 when inducing this um, uh, pro-inflammatory environment in these macrophages producing uh, NOS2 that's inducing nitric oxide. We have <coughs> TNF and we have uh, Rantis, a chemokine as well and that's stimulated with classical activation and as well heat killed MTB can induce this heterodimer complex inducing AL12 and we also have LPS through the TLR4 signaling pathway inducing SOX1. So in an environment where we have TB presence here we have a classical stimulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines shown here we have AL12, we have NOS2 and if you know about infection diseases these are no normally important, actually, to give you control uh, of TB uh, because uh, RANT is important to recruit other inflammatory sites of infection. TNF can activate the macrophages to induce nitric oxide, and which is shown here as well. So we thought, okay, let's just take this BTF2 knockouts. We imported this BTF2 knockout mice, and we wanted to perform uh, functional infection experiments by the absence of BTF2. And what is shown here, this is a simple mortality study, and again, of importance that we use the MTB, the clinical strain, the HN878. And to really our surprise, what you can see here, these are the BTF2 knockout mice on wild. 
and they actually completely survived. So even though they have reduced TNF, reduced CCL5, reduced R12, they actually survived that, um, that, that strain, that paging, very aggressive hypervalent strain of HN878. In comparison, that's the Valta mice, um, they actually uh, died very rapidly, that's already three weeks post-infection. And you can see here, uh, if you look in a little bit more in detail, the histopathology, the pulmonary histopathology, three weeks. This is a l long sections of a wild type mice that's infected with TB. So what we can see here are the normal alveoli. But then you have a very ma massive I infiltration of many inflammatory cells. So you have monocytes, macrophages, neutrophils um, that actually induces uh, large lesions. And in particular, when the BTF2 is knocked out, uh, you can see these uh, granulomas are much more well-formed, well-confined, and able to control um, the, the proliferation. But it, the important <coughs> is in the pathology, so in the absence of BTF2, the pathology is much more reduced compared to the wild type. And this is probably shown as well by the cell numbers that's recru recruited to the, um, to the, week, to the three weeks in the lungs that the, in the wild type you have a prominent alveolar macrophages, inflammatory macrophages, but in absence of BTF2, uh, these <coughs> inflammatory for macrophages recruitment is significantly reduced. So in conclusion, really BTF2 uh, prevents pathology in the lungs. In the absence of BTF2 prevents pathology. And do we have any correlation to the humans? And this is really in a collaboration with the South African TB vaccine initiative where we actually looked at the BTF2 expression in active TB patients. And you can see here that's an active TB patient versus the healthy controls. These are the, the healthy controls. These are just volunteers, um, but they have uh, e either latent infected with TB, there's quantum fear on positive, or quantum fear negative. The importance we're looking at the BTF2 expression, and they're quite low. But when we're looking at those infected with TB, the active TB patients which are coughing, the bacteria, they have a very high levels of BTF2 compared to the, the healthy controls. So um, ca can as well BTF2 be used as a biomarker to then uh, predict TB? And for that uh, purpose, we also collaborated with SATVI. And here, what we're showing um, that they recruited about 6,000 healthy volunteers the RNA was collected every six months, and then at the end stage that they identified TB progresses. <coughs> it's a little bit easier to show here. So before the patients were developing active TB, they uh, collected the RNA. You can see here that's mi minus 18 months before active TB was diagnosed in these patients, and uh, minus 12 and minus 6. And the question is, in, in patients, they do not yet have active TB, but infected with MTB, do we have a differential um, biomarker profiling for those that subsequently develop active TB? So in other words, what you can see here, the BTF2 was actually significantly upregulated um, in these uh, patients that subsequently develop active TB. So they're infected with MTB, but they're not actively have an active diseases, but the BTF2 was already uh, very high up. And this BTF2 was as well part of a signature signature, uh, signature gene profiling showing that BTF2 among these other three transcription factor um, before this patient develop active TB, it's very high up. So that can be then used as a prognostic marker and potentially starting uh, TB therapy much earlier before really active TB starting. So in conclusion, what we showed in our part that BTF2 causes inflammation in mice, uh, um, explaining as well the, the TB disease progression. So I have another 20 minutes, and we actually want to investigate as well other drug targets. And what we showed in our review here in particular is, so where do you really look at? In particular, we're looking at macrophages, because the <coughs> rationale for that, you can see here, TB is shown in red. It wants to get into the macrophages. There's an active uptake of MTB into the macrophages. It wants in the macrophages. It can prevent antigen processing. And this really prevents adaptive immunity. And I will go a little bit faster here, but you can see that TB 
as well escapes from this hostile environment of the phagosomes into the cytoplasms, and these are virulence factors from TB that they are actively producing this translocation, and once inside the cytoplasms induces additional virulence factors <coughs> in red, and this is all, always important to suppress innate signaling pathways. Um, and as well, these are hallmark signal virulence factor, the man lamp, and it really prevents the, the fa phagosome uh, acidification. You can see it prevents the proton pump into the phagosomes, and as well, it uh, blocks calcium. And this really helps for TB uh, that not going into the phagosome lysosome environment, so TB also actively blocks the fusion between phagosome and lysosome, and the rationale for that is really you have uh, lytic enzymes that are normally um, given into these phagosomes and they can kill intracellular pathogens, but TB wants to block this, this fusion. And in addition, it can also use other virulence factors that, blocks, um, that blocks re reactive nitrogen intermediate and reactive oxygen intermediates. It also blocks antimicrobial peptide and as well it suppresses autophagy, uh, which is a normal degradation system. And, uh, but it can also use the host, host response against MTB. So as you can see here, um, the magnitude of differential response to MTB is very large. So where should we really focus and which factors, host factors should we target to enable MTB um, not to persist in macrophages? So for that reason, I'm actually looking into patients directly. And the rationale for that is um, when MT, when MTB gets transmitted and develops persistence in the lungs, you can see here this is a particular macrophages so called these foamy macrophages. They're actually loaded full of lipids. So you can see this MTB is very close uh, proximity to, to these lipid bodies. And um, these lipid bodies, what it, this is a picture from David Russell I got from here, and these lipid bodies are actually loaded full of cholesterol. So there might be an association between cholesterol and mycobacterium tuberculosis. And we actually thought, and you're the first one to really show that, uh, can we actually block cholesterol using statins that has been used for, 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 for many, many years and is a worldwide description that was the biggest selling drug worldwide for many years. And statins actually used um, to re reduce arteriosclerosis, um, mm -hmm. heart diseases as well. And can we actually use now these statins as a host-directed drug therapy for TB? Um, so that, that was really our experimental um, hypothesis in the beginning stage. And um, before really starting the experiments as well, we wanted to look in, in uh, epidemiological studies. So we just screened the literature and asked the question, uh, does statin has any beneficial effect on the mortality uh, with bacteremia? So in a simple example, that's a snapshot of that paper and just showing that uh, unfortunately all these uh, patients at the time when they went to the hospital, they died to many types of bacteremia. And uh, at the time uh, of administration, they asked the, the other patients, have you taken statins or not? So those that have taken statins, they actually had a reduced uh, numbers of deaths. So you can see there's only one death of uh, antibacterial species. So that gave us a little bit of confidence to show, yes, statins might have some beneficial effect on the mortality against bacteremia, and we started our infection experiments. And so here we took the advantage of the humans in, in Cape Town that actually, um, these are patients that daily treated on statins, so they take a daily dose of statins. And the question is, are these statins changing the immunomotory um, environment of the PBMCs or, or the circulating uh, leukocytes? And therefore, we actually uh, extracted the PBMCs. You can see here between these are patients on statins on those controls. And, you, and then when we took these PBMCs in ex vivo, we cultured them. We gave MTB on top of it and waited another uh, five days. And we want to investigate those PBMCs that have been taken from these patients on statins. Is the intracellular growth of TB reduced to controls? And it, indeed, you can see here the significant reduced growth of MTB in these statin-treated patients. Um, <coughs> from the PBM scene as well, we showed this in MDMs. These are monocyte-derived macrophages from these statins that have been taken daily 
um, from these patients that have been daily taking statins. And you can see here as well the significant reduced growth of intracellular MTB when we uh, ex vivo infected these cultures. And we subsequently also performed experiments in mice. So these are just primary macrophages, treated them with statins. And you can see here the growth of intracellular TB is markedly reduced. It's a time kinetics. This is simvastatin compared to the controls. An important simvastatin is not toxic against the cells. This is just the cell viability uh, today's post-infection. So um, we also performed these experiments in human PBMCs. These are healthy human PBMCs. Give, we, uh, we gave these different uh, types of statin, simvastatin, aterostatin. And here you can see again, after 72 hours post-infection, the growth of TB inside macrophages is down. Um, th does really statin act as a HDT, as a host-directed therapy, directly on the host, or does it maybe also uh, induce direct killing of MTB? Because the rationale of that, that statins um, acts on the HMG co-reductase, and MTB has been shown also to have autolog of these HMG a reductase. So w what we've done there, we simply uh, gave statins in culture of TB, and you can see here that's the extracellular growth. So we just take TB in culture with that different concentration of statins, and um, you can see here the growth is not affected by different uh, types of sets, statin, simvastatin, atrovastatin, rosovastatin. So that really shows us as well the statin directly acts on the host rather than killing MTB directly. So subsequently, we started statin treatment in mice. Um, we took a mice, we treated them statins every second day. I gave MTB, and then we looked at four weeks and eight weeks uh, post, uh, post infection, the growth of bacteria directly into the lungs and in the spleen as a dissemination. And you can see here with rosovastatin, we have a reduced bacterial growth. And as, uh, importantly, dissemination in spleen is reduced to compared to the controls. And the same trend we have at the eight weeks after infection as well, that um, particularly uh, rosovastatin in the lungs, but uh, in terms of dissemination, both types of statins prevents dissemination in the spleens. So we have, uh, in conclusion, we have a reduced bacterial burden in presence of statins, but as well, the importance is in the pathology as well, that the pathology is reduced. Um, these are lung sections, again, these are controls with a large inflammation. These are simvastatin and rosovastatin reducing inflammation, uh, particularly rosovastatin, um, compared to the controls. So, conclusion, statins uh, kill, kills, uh, uh, leads to reduction of TB growth, but as well on the pathology. Um, so, which uh, downstream pathways is important is statin-mediated uh, effect. So it's a bit complicated because this mevalinate, in order to produce cholesterol, um, you have this mevalinate pathway. It's a very complicated pathway, but uh, it actually branches up in one prenylating uh, function of this pathway in a cholesterol-producing pathway. And we performed metabolic rescue experiments. And we actually showed there as well that um, this is the intracellular growth of TB in macrophages. After simvastatin, it's down. I showed you that before. And when we restore the mevalinate pathway, you can see there's a restoration of the growth of TB. So showing again that statins acts directly on this mevalinate pathway. But in order to, to understand or to investigate which pathway is more important, the prenylation or the cholesterol, and we thought it would be cholesterol. But surprisingly, we actually saw it as well that uh, rescuing um, with um, squalene or generaline. Generaline, which is shown here, the GG or the squalene, both actually restored the uh, partially, only partially restored the effect of the reduced uh, growth of intracellular MTB. So in conclusion, that shows not only is cholesterol important uh, for that host-mediated effect, but we also have uh, prenylation of proteins, many prenylation of proteins. Um, that leads to the effect of, of statin on a protective host, host response. So um, this, if you go a little bit more in detail as well, remember the review that I uh, initially showed you, so which um, are some of the autophagy or the phagosomal maturation uh, difference. So we actually, uh, thank you, 
uh, this is just an MTB, a GFP expressing MTB with a lamp 3. That's a marker of late. Um, and uh, this is a marker of when the phagosome fused already <coughs> with the phagolysosomes, a phagolysosomal marker. And then um, what we see here is colocalization by confocal. MTB colocalizes with lamp 3. And the, the, the question is now, that's the statin ones, if you actually uh, overlay that to the non-statin treated macrophages, do we have differential colocalization? And you can see here that's a simvastatin. Indeed, MTB colocalizes to the early phagosomal marker. Um, it also colocalizes in presence of simvastatin to the late phagosomal marker. And as well, autophagy is increased in presence of simvastatin compared to the controls. So you can see again MTB colocalizes to the uh, LC3 compartment. This is just a colocalization uh, percentage that you can see in presence of simvastatin in white, early, late phagosomal, but as well autophagy is increased. And this is just the Western blot as a confirmation again. Um, so that really shows us that um, in a summary that I showed here in the review that we can, can potentially target cholesterol, but also statins has other effect on the prenylation pathways and, and, and it therefore does also induces this phagosomal maturation, induces this phagolysosome fusion, and as well inducing autophagy. So these are all these pathways that subsequently leads then to reduce growth of MTB in macrophages. Um, so we were the first one who published it. After that, there were other research groups. Uh, Petrus Karakuski, he's based at the University of Washington, and he's also looking as a adjunctive therapy because as a HDT, you not only want to, um, to, to give the HDT only, you want to have in combination with the current anti-TB drugs. These are adjunctive therapy, and the question was really to ask, do we have increased clearance when we give simvastatin in presence of these three different types of antibiotics? This is uh, um, rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrazimanib, and you can see here the infected mice, start a treatment, and those that actually maybe focus on these ones here, you have an increased clearance of, um, of MTB growth into the lungs when you give a combination therapy with uh, current antibiotic treatments and simvastatins. We have clearance already 3.5 months after treatment, and then here this is just the, uh, the HRZ, antibiotics only. So it also shows that um, together um, simvastatin with the current anti-TB drugs is more effective than current anti-TB drugs alone. And uh, important, they also showed in the pathology. The pathology was also more reduced in the HRZ uh, plus simvastatin, so these are the current anti-TB drugs with simvastatin compared to the controls. Um, can also statins be used as a potential host-directed therapy for TB in humans? Um, so there was uh, last year, in 2016, uh, th there was a prospective court study as well showing that statin is beneficial against TB, and this is a very large population-based nested case control study. They had uh, one million subjects. They were randomized from 24 million individuals from the Taiwanese National Health Insurance. And uh, what I actually showed as a summary here, I just summarized in that table as well, they looked at disease risk score. So um, the higher that number, the higher, the higher is the risk to develop active TB. So you can see those that, that recently used statins have quite a high risk, and those that currently use statins have a reduced risk of developing active TB. And it also depends on the duration of statins, so in other words, how many days of statins was used in these uh, patients. So they actually used more than 90 days. If you treat patients more than 90 days, the, the, the risk to developing active TB is significantly uh, reduced compared to those that only took statins from 30 to 90 days. So in the summary as well, a statin uh, was associated with a protective effect against TB. And what is important here as well is the length. So you should treat patients more than 90 days. Um, so we actually... Uh, in the end stage there, so I don't want to go too much in details. It's the end of the talk, so we also submitted the EDCP grant now to really treat uh, patients uh, with uh, TB patients with statins, and um, 
the first stage was successful, so we're actually uh, submitting another one in, in March, the, the final round. So this is the end of my talk, and I would like to acknowledge all our research team that's in the beginning stage, Lerato Michael, uh, for the MGBs and the drug compound screening, and then as well um, those that provided us the MGBs from the University of Strathclyde, Colin and Fraser, and Kath Catherine Carter for the NIFs, and as well um, Harukazo and Sugata from the Ricken Institute um, in regarding the Phantom 5 and the deep cage analysis, and the help of Sebastian, the bioinformaticians, and as well the acknowledgement of CDRI, where we want to take this uh, thing forward to statins and really want to look at the <coughs> clinical trials uh, with active TB patients um, and the role of statins. And these are all the funders, and also would like to acknowledge ICGB and the invitation for Alessandro to be able to uh, present the data. Thank you very much for your attention.